Hello, this is Dr. Housinger, and this course is CDP 400. And we are going to be using the PowerPoint associated with the book. And the actual PowerPoint is with the Moodle every week as well, so you have the opportunity to see that. All right. So the book starts out with discussing that addiction has been around ever since substances have been around. Um, and there's a division in the field, and you're seeing the new paradigm come in um, in juxtaposition to the old paradigm in which we have an abstinence only. That's the only way to do it. You have to stop. You can never use again, that type of thing, really based on the 12-step approach. A drug is a drug is a drug. And then we have the harm reduction model, which looks at addiction through a public health lens, and we'll spend a, a great deal of time looking at harm reduction and where it came from later on in the course. And with harm reduction, the goal is to make use safer, and whether that turns into abstinence or not is the decision of the user. We look at doing things that would decrease the risk for somebody who is engaging in risky behaviors. So one of the reasons why I selected this book for this class is because of the strengths-based perspective and the biopsychosocial aspect of it. And you will see throughout this book that um, the different theories of addiction are covered as well as the biopsychosocial aspect. Okay. Um, there's several different theories of addiction um, and remember that a theory is not necessarily right or wrong. It's a lens to, to view, to view different ideas from. So I like to think of it as you're putting on your sunglasses and maybe your sunglasses are purple. And so you have a purple tint to what you're seeing in the world. Or maybe you have the rose colored sunglasses. So um, please feel free to agree or disagree with the information that we're going to be presenting in terms of the theories of addiction. Um, it is a very interesting subject, and we could talk about it for hours and hours. Right. So in your Moodle for this week, we have the ASAM, American Society of Addiction Medicine, definition of addiction, which is several pages long. So you have the paragraph version, and then you have the four to five page version of it. It's very complex. Um, <clears throat> so some examples of addiction that you might see is maybe... Um, the person that has a, a trach tube and they're on oxygen and they're smoking, um, and they're on oxygen because they were smoking and they could blow up at any minute for, if the cigarette sparks the oxygen. That's a, a, an example that you might be familiar with. Um, <clears throat> this idea of a rock bottom um, really speaks to motivation, and some people don't believe in the idea that they're the rock bottom. Um, and what that looks like is the rock bottom is, okay, this is my low, I'm going to turn things around. And that can look like things for different people. So one of the things about addiction is that it's not logical. It doesn't make sense to the non-addicted logical brain. Um, and so some of the examples, and this book has a lot of stories in it and case studies you're going to see. Um, if you're unfamiliar with addiction, it might make you scratch your head a little bit, but hopefully through this course we will aim to uh, explain and uh, further deepen your understanding of addiction. Okay. Um, <clears throat> going back to the examples, um, arrest, people with addictions becoming arrested, people using while pregnant. Um, <clears throat> and then the last example here, girl hooked on meth, she started using to lose weight. One of the things that we want to look at with addiction is when do we cross the line from experimentation or use into um, disordered use. We're not going to be using the word dependence as much anymore, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later on in terms of this paradigm shift that we are going through. Um, not only do we have the, the micro-level effects of addiction on an individual and their family, we have the, the mess on the community, and then the global cost um, of addiction as well. Uh, drug wars, um, drug sentencing, incarceration. Um, we have big business involved in addiction, gambling, um, of course, pharma, big pharma, um, and alcohol. Right. 
and now we have the marijuana industry. So we're going to be looking at this through a biopsychosocial lens, but also a micro meso macro lens. So what is addiction? If we look at the Latin, addictus, meaning attached to something, um, <clears throat> one of the, the paradigms or theories of addiction that's very popular today um, and has been for the past 25 or 30 years or so is that alcoholism and addiction is a disease. Um, and that is one of the theories that is, is uh, debatable, debatable. Is addiction a disease or not? Is it something that's learned? Is it a, a moral flaw? Um, one of the older paradigms of addiction was that it was a, a sign of weakness. And we still see this kind of implanted into the criminal justice system. Um, we're in a transition period where a lot of times addiction is not treated and it's treated through jail, jail time or prison time um, instead of being prevented. Uh, we're, we're in the middle, again, of a shift with healthcare integration and looking at co-occurring disorders. Um, <clears throat> but that is one of the arguments. Um, is addiction a moral weakness? Is it a disease? Do we learn it? Um, is there a genetic component, um, um, something that's inherited as well? Okay. All right. So prior to 2013, the American Psychological Association had the DSM-4, and it's changed every so often to reflect um, progressions in society, as well as uh, changes in ethics. For example, in the second iteration of the DSM, DSM number two, homosexuality was listed as a, a mental disorder. And so you can see that we do have to update these things from time to time, and it's largely politically and historically and culturally motivated. Okay. Uh, in this week's Moodle model, you have a comparison chart between the DSM-4 and the DSM-5. Okay. Uh, prior to 2013, we were using the DSM-4, and it was very it was uh, very dichotomous. You had substance abuse and substance dependence. Now, the issue with that is the word dependence having been used synonymously with addiction. If somebody is insulin dependent, are they addicted to insulin? No, they're not, but they need it to survive. Okay. So just because a person is dependent upon something does not necessarily mean that they are addicted to that. So we went from a dichotomous, you are abusing a substance, to you're dependent on it, to what we're using now, which is the spectrum. Um, and we are no longer using chemical dependency or chemical dependency professionals. We are moving into SUD, substance use disorder spectrum. So a person would no longer be a chemical dependency professional. They'd be a substance use disorder spectrum <laughs> professional, a setup. So, um, <clears throat> so now we have a spectrum. And what was happening previously was that, um, Criminal justice, if somebody was arrested for something, that was a clinical criteria. And we know that the criminal justice system is largely prejudiced um, and there's systemic racism and bureaucracy involved. And so we know that the majority of drug users are Caucasian. However, the people that are arrested for drug crimes tend to be uh, Hispanic, um, Black, and of other uh, mixed ancestries and, and heritages and races. So th when they decided about the DSM-5, they took that out of there. Okay. So um, in order to have substance use disorder, you need to have two of the, of the uh, different criteria that you had here. And now if we go from mild, moderate to severe instead of you have a problem or you don't have a problem. Okay. Um, <clears throat> six or more of the, if you have six or more, it's a severe and then um, <clears throat> four to five would be a moderate problem. Okay. So the criteria of uh, criminality or have you been arrested has been taken off of the official um, diagnostic criteria, but we have tolerance, which of course is where you start to use and then your body needs more of the substance to get the effect. Withdrawal, um, using more than intended 
maybe a person decides that they're going to have one to two beers and they can't stop at two and they stop, they are into five or six deep. Um, reduced involvement in life and obligations, right? Cravings. Um, this is, is, uh, rooted in new science that shows that the brain changes um, <clears throat> with substances and that uh, there's a whole science to cravings and what it does in the brain. Okay. Um, is the person wanting to cut down but has been unsuccessful? Are they unable to stop? Okay, so these two definitely inform each other. Excessive effort to abstain a substance. So uh, sometimes it can become a full-time job, getting it, using it, recovering from it. Use despite social problems, uh, especially marital problems, relationship problems, um, friends, using when physically hazardous, so this could be driving under the influence. Um, <clears throat> every once in a while there's a report of somebody from an Amish community, usually a teenager, um, getting arrested for driving a bicycle, drunk, or a horse and buggy, that happens every so often. Uh, using at work where you're operating equipment. Um, and failure to fulfill obligations. All right. <clears throat> so for the purposes of um, of the book that we're using um, <clears throat> and looking at it through a strengths based biopsychosocial perspective, this is the addiction that we're going to be looking at: a pattern of compulsive use, loss of control over a substance or behavior. It has physical, psychological, and social aspects, and the emphasis is on the process rather than the outcome. So we want to look at intention. Okay. Um, when we're dealing with addictions, we want to look at when did it become something that you're using to relax with in terms of um, it transitioning to be something that you have to have because you can't live your life without it um, <clears throat> or other situations like that. So the intention and set and setting are really important and we'll talk about that later on. Okay. One of the other changes with the DSM-5 is that gambling is now considered an addictive disorder. The definition of gambling or the criteria, pattern of preoccupation, lack of control, using it as a form of escape, chasing losses, sense of euphoria when anticipating a win, and deceit to hide distracted behavior. It's very similar to a lot of the, be the behaviors that we see with um, addiction to substances. And when we think about addiction, we might automatically think about substances instead of behavior. So not only will we be looking at the use of substances, we'll be looking at behaviors such as shopping, gambling, and eating disorders. Okay. <clears throat> so one of the things that you're going to be looking at is, is addiction a disease? Uh, is alcoholism, is drug addiction a disease? And <clears throat> you will have a couple different films to watch. We'll be watching an argument for that with Dr. Kevin McCauley. Um, and then you'll be watching one from uh, Mr. Lewis about uh, addiction is not a disease. And they both attack it from a science perspective. Um, this is a subject of that I'd like to talk about during our Voxer conversation this week. Okay. Um, there are certainly pro arguments to it and con arguments to it. And we're going to be exploring it this semester. One of the pros to the addiction is a disease is that it made it a health condition. Addiction is covered under the American with Disabilities Act and it is also now covered by all insurances. It's a federal law and it is illegal for insurance companies not to cover mental health and substance use treatment and that wasn't always that way. So this is true of state insurance, this is true of private pay insurance as well. So by making it a medical condition, it became medically covered. Um, <clears throat> one of the cons of this might be a colloquial attitude of people saying, well, it's a disease, it's never going away, and then using that as an excuse um, to use. It's not always treated like a disease, though. Um, <clears throat> the addiction field has famously been underserved. Um, there hasn't always traditionally been um, a lot of education required. So in general, and we'll discuss this, um, we have chemical dependency professionals and chemical dependency professional trainees that deliver most of the counseling. Um, <clears throat> and now what we're doing with the, with the um, Healthcare Integration Act is that we have to have co-occurring treatment. So no longer do we 
well, it's still not all, all the way integrated, but we're working toward that. But um, in an integrated setting, and if you're looking for treatment, uh, this is something that you might want to look for. You wouldn't have to go to outpatient to see a mental health counselor and then go to a different building to see across town to see a drug and alcohol counselor. It would be treated together, and the primary point of contact would be your PCP, primary care provider. Okay. Um, and we're seeing more medical professionals now getting addictions training. Um, but unless a person specializes in it, uh, there is not a lot of training actually in, in medical school. And so now we're seeing a lot of people coming back with their master's degrees and nursing degrees to take the CD classes. Okay. So I would like you to think this week about what's a uh, pro for looking at um, addiction as a disease and the cons about addiction as a disease. Okay. Another resource that you have this week in your Moodle model are the stages of alcoholism by Jelinek. The stages and also the types of alcoholism. He divided them into five different categories. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so if we're looking at disease, <laughs> it's a condition or tendency regarded as abnormal or harmful. Disease is absence of ease. And... <clears throat> There's a trifecta here, primary, progressive, chronic, and could potentially be fatal. And so proponents of the disease perspective believe that it fits using these criteria. Okay. Um, <clears throat> your author of the textbook prefers the word illness instead of uh, disease because it is less controversial and less medical. Okay. Um, <clears throat> And one of the main arguments for addiction as a disease is that the addicted brain changes form and shape. Okay. Uh, and so the medical community, uh, we can see that. We can see that in scans. Um, against, some people believe and theorize that it's a habit or behavior um, and that the person with the disease needs to take responsibility. And some people believe that um, people mature out of addiction. Um, in chapter one of your book, it's quite interesting. Um, <clears throat> about 10% of people that use drugs and alcohol are truly addicted. And even a smaller percentage of that actually make it to treatment. So for the majority of people that use, um, people don't become addicted to it. And, and they can use throughout their life. Um, your book also states that around age 21, 80% of people could meet the DSM criteria for alcoholism. Um, because what happens at 21 in the United States, you can legally drink and buy alcohol. And so we do see phases or bursts of using, and use does not necessarily mean that somebody has a problem with it, and people can go in and out of phases. But there is a per there is a percentage of people, about ten percent of our population, um, <clears throat> that really do struggle with addiction to substances or cross addiction or multiple addictions. And there's the argument: well, do some people have an addictive personality, or are they prone to addiction as well? So again, I just want to reiterate that there are a lot of theories about addiction. Um, you don't have to agree or disagree with everything. You can take bits and pieces, of course. Just please look at everything through a critical lens. Okay. So for your social work and psychology majors, our biopsychosocial spiritual model, um, we're looking at the why, the biology, what's going on at the cellular level, the what, what's going on in my head, and where is it happening, which is where am I? What's happening socially? Okay. Um, for spirituality, we're looking at a connection with something that's higher. And in the 12-step model, they often say higher higher power to mean God or whatever that looks like to you. And some of the other alternatives to recovery, it's worded different. SAMHSA defines spirituality in a very simple way that can be helpful for people that have difficulty connecting to what does the word spiritual mean? Does it mean religious? And in essence, uh, SAMHSA's definition, if we're looking at the eight dimensions of wellness for spirituality, is simply a connection to something greater than myself. There's no mention of religion. It's just a connection to something greater than myself. Okay. And dimension six of the ASAM, which we'll talk about, how we assess 
Persons for Addiction um, covers spirituality. Okay. Now, one of the the questions about addiction is, is, is it a chicken or an egg type thing? Am I depressed because I drink or do I drink because I'm depressed? And where does that cycle start? So it's very much a cycle and it's not something that's linear. And when we look at the stages of change and motivation, we'll look at where somebody can come in and out of motivation. It's not a, I did this and then I do this and then I do this. It's a very much um, a cycle. Um, we're going to be spending a great deal of time talking about the family as a system or as dominoes and the roles and the interaction and what recovery looks like as a family. Okay. If you hear thumping or my computer suddenly goes out, my cat probably ran across my screen. So, okay. Getting back to addiction. About 80% of people behind bars, so jails, and prisons, and also um, there's, we could also parlay this into persons um, in psychiatric institutions as well, um, have substance abuse problems. Okay. So that's staggering. So the majority of people that are incarcerated in various venues struggle with addiction problems. Uh, in a survey of social workers, 71% of social workers stated that their their clients um, had substance use disorders. Okay. Now, again, we're going to be looking at different types of addiction. Um, you may have heard the term tanorexia. I recommend the show My Strange Addiction. There's a lot of behavioral things on that show, and tanorexia is one of them. And we're going to be looking at internet and screen addiction later on this semester as well. And there is a local treatment center called Restart up in Seattle for adolescent males who struggle with screen addiction. There are a lot of really great movies about addiction. 28 Days with Sandra Bullock, not to be confused with 28 Days Later, which is a horror film. Uh, Traffic, Walk the Line, Rock Room for a Dream, Spun, there are so many of them out there. Um, Flight with uh, Denzel Washington, and addiction looks like different things. Okay. Right. All right. <clears throat> so the author of your textbook, um, and largely where the field is going right now, we're moving towards a strengths-based perspective rather than a traditional perspective. And this is where the dichotomy comes into play. So in a traditional approach, um, you're either a normie or you're a user. Um, there's a lot of labels. So if you've ever been to a 12-step meeting and in this class, you will have the opportunity to go to a 12-step meeting. If you go to a 12-step meeting and you introduce yourself, you say, hi, my name is so-and-so and I'm an alcoholic. Okay, so right there, there's, there's a label. And in their theory, um, they believe that it unifies everyone there and brings people to the same playing ground. But there are a lot of people that don't like that because they think that um, that's all they are with their identity or that um, it's a negative thing to be associated with. Okay. All right. The focus is on losses. Um, resistance to change can be seen as denial and not rich information. So the way that if a person is not motivated or they're not ready to give up their substance or become abstinent, it can be seen as, oh, you're in denial, you have to hit your rock bottom. Um, in the strengths-based perspective, we're going to look at that differently. We avoid the labels. We focus on the strengths and use the family as a resource. And so we, we're great spin doctors. We spin things around a little bit um, <clears throat> and reframe things into a positive context. So if a person is ambivalent, Towards change, we're going to explore that instead of jumping and saying, well, you're in denial. You can't change until you want to change. Why are you having difficulty giving up the substance? What would your ideal outcome look like? How is using helping you? How is using hurting you? And so we have more of a dialogue and encourage that dialogue to bloom. Okay, so here's another uh, representation of that. We have our um, biology here, either you have it or you don't, whereas in the strength space, it's on a continuum. Uh, are you experimenting? Is it um, being misused? Do you have a mild, moderate, or severe problem? The uh, psychological, um, 
<clears throat> it's a one size fits all abstinence based treatment versus in psycho we're looking at strengths, motivation, and then social we're looking at um, does it run in the family? Where is the dysfunction? Are you using to cope with a parent, etc.? Um, then we're going to use the family as a resource. Okay. So there's multiple ways to go about treating addiction that we'll look at this, sem this semester. Um, and addiction recovery management, <clears throat> it's strengths-based approved by the UN. Uh, case management can be very helpful in addiction. So we have, usually you have three different parts of, of treatment. You have the peer support, which is your 12-step meetings. And the focus on that is not counseling. The focus is to find strength, support, and hope from others that have been through the same thing you are. But it's not a substitute for counseling. Um, the second is counseling. Counseling is usually longer term. We get to the root depth of the issues and how we're going to um, identify patterns and new skills to learn. And then case management is linking the client up to resources and helping them with tools. Okay. The case manager and the counselor are often the same person, but the case manager counselor should never be the sponsor or peer support. There are peer support roles within agencies, uh, and that's handled a little bit differently. Okay. All right. <clears throat> we need community resources for long-term care and interventions that relate to personal needs. So mental care, mental health care, housing, parenting classes, um, pro bono legal services if necessary. Okay. Okay. So think about wraparound services. And we measure success not necessarily in abstinence, um, but in moderated and modified behavior. So maybe somebody is drinking five drinks every day, and then they are able to go to four, and then to three, and then maybe they're drinking every other day. Okay, so measurable goals is very important. There are six critical elements conducive to recovery, and you'll see that the majority of people do not go to treatment. And there is such a thing as a natural recovery, and these six elements are involved there, but treatment also provides these six elements as well. <clears throat> so the person is not the illness. So we're separating the symptoms from the self-worth of the person. The need for control and choice. So this would be collaborating and giving the client options. Hope. Hope that life can get better and can be what you envision it to be. A purpose. That could look like a job. That could look like volunteering. That could look like parenting. could look like a lot of things. Achievement. Measurable goals and achieving measurable goals. And the presence of at least one key supportive person. So there are strengths in the divergent modules. There's certainly strengths in harm reduction and certainly strengths in abstinence only based. Um, it's very important that we fit the treatment to the client and not vice versa. Right. Um, there are some resources out there if you wanna look at the, the negative views of the disease model, Stanton Peel resisting 12 step coercion. Um, and harm reduction in the strengths pers perspective, we're going to spend some time on that um, and show you some great resources. Uh, especially out here um, in Washington State and Seattle, we're seeing this right now with policy issues of reducing harm, particularly the debate over should we have clean needle injection sites. Um, previously, um, the city of Seattle had set aside about $8 million to build two, and then they decided that um, there was such an outcry about where would these physical locations be, so they decided to look at mobile units. Um, but it was blocked by the federal government at this time, so they're still intending to do that, and this is something that you can keep up to date on with current events. Okay. Project Match. Um, <clears throat> Your book talks a lot about this, and they compared different types of treatment to look at their efficacy and efficiency. It was directed by Nia um, with 2,000 clients over eight years, which is the largest trial of psychotherapy. So it's a, quite a large sample size. They looked um, at 12-step facilitation. So that's a little bit different than 12-step, um, going to a 12-step meeting where you may or not 
may not be taken through the steps. So there's different types of 12-step meetings. Um, there's process meetings where you go and you talk about your day. There's speaker meetings. There's book meetings. Um, usually a person would get a sponsor and work through the steps. 12-step facilitation would be a treatment center that walks people through the 12 steps and 12 traditions. Okay. Um, <clears throat> cognitive, so that's your cognitive behavioral therapy, which is very cost effective and it works for individuals and in groups. And typical CBT groups are about 12 to 16 weeks long, so a relatively short amount of time for the results that they produce. Okay. And we have a motivational enhancement therapy. Uh, based off of motivational interviewing. It's very cost-effective. Um, it's helpful for those with low motivation. It doesn't work for people with high motivation because they're already motivated. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Twelve-step is very good for um, a religious framework. It is based in Christianity, um, and it has been adopted by different sects of Christianity and other religions. Okay. And then uh, cognitive Behavioral therapy is very good with pathology. Okay. Right. Oh. The criticism of um, Project Match was that there wasn't a control group. Um, MET was a shorter intervention, but that also might be because it only needs to be shorter. Okay. And then uh, it just looked at alcoholism and not other substances of choice. Now what this project did do is it confirmed the effectiveness for diverse treatments, which shows us that we need to have many options for our clients, not just one or two. Right. Um, in Valiance Research, there was a 40-year-long longitudinal study. Um, those who were in recovery in middle age were found to have had personal willpower, a church group membership, and stable marital, stable marital relationship and hobbies. So look how well-rounded this is. Okay, so... We have those six criteria here, don't we? All right. Okay. <clears throat> Some more research for you. Um, in California, they looked at $1 spent on treatment saved $7 across the state. Okay. So we know that we do need uh, states and our governments to invest in treatment. Brief interventions are very helpful, motivational interviewing. Um, <clears throat> also, if we look at addiction through a holistic lens and we're able to um, pair different treatments, certainly if a person exercises, they're probably going to have some results. But if they pair diet and exercise, they're going to have greater results. And so <clears throat> we want to look at that as well. So we have motivational interviewing naltrexone, um, MAT, which is medical assisted med medication or medically assisted treatment, and then cognitive therapy. So if we can use more than one thing, um, and hit addiction through the biopsychosocial lens, not just one, but all three, then uh, we can have great success. All right. So some of the things that we're seeing right now is that <clears throat> we have more prescription drug misuse, and there's some interesting policy occurring around that right now in um, December 2017 or 2018, one of the first big uh, pharma billionaires was actually arrested and charged in his trial was this past spring 2019 um, for bribing doctors to prescribe medications, specifically opiates. Okay. Um, so there's some interesting policy happening around that, including prosecuting doctors who overprescribe. Okay. We're seeing harm reduction being increasingly recognized in the United States, looking at it through a public health approach. And this really came from the AIDS epidemic of the 1980s. Um, and that's one of the models that we use harm reduction with. Uh, more and more places are looking at non-abstinence-based treatment programs, including using medical marijuana um, instead of opiate treatment and using um, more MATs. <clears throat> We're seeing more and more that um, harsh drug laws are causing harm, and in several states, where marijuana is legal recreationally, the governors of those states have given pardons to people that had marijuana sentences and letting a lot of people out of prison. Most Americans do favor treatment over jail. We're looking at uh, how can we keep people out of jail and keep them connected to their communities and give them support. And also for those that are leaving jails and prisons, how can we help them 
with reentry. We see drug courts and mental health courts, really fantastic programs that bridge that gap between the punitive side and the therapeutic side and the social side as well. We are looking more at co-occurring disorders and how they inform each other in mental health and substance use. And we're looking at reducing craving through medication, so there's your MATs. And then restorative justice, how do we work with uh, victims and defenders to promote healing? All right, so this is your introduction to treatment. Um, I hope that you find this class stimulating and exciting, and please pose any questions that you have for me to our Voxer discussion this week. When somebody begins to think that a loved one or family member has a drug or alcohol problem, it is really frightening because none of us know how to start, where to start, and where to go. Addiction is unpleasant to the person who has it and to the family of the person that has it, and that's why you want to treat it. This is not something that develops overnight for any individual and that generally there is a series of steps that the individuals go through from experimentation and occasional use through the actual loss of control of use. Use becomes compulsive and people become preoccupied with it. It becomes very, very important to them. The, um, one of the ways I define addiction is wanting the wrong thing very, very badly. Drug addiction is a disease of the brain that translates, that that disease translates into abnormal behavior. When a person who has this disease is exposed to cues or stimuli that remind them of or have previously been associated with the use of a drug, there is an uncontrollable reflex. It happens very, very quickly in the brain. We can see it in brain imaging. Uh, and the person doesn't have the ability to stop it. As a matter of fact, it may happen before they're even conscious of it. I'm out here alone now, trying to uh, hang on and survive. The holidays were rough. I actually thought this one would be different. But right near the end, some other things happened. Um, with my uh, wife and the family, and um, I didn't respond very well. I um, said I'm going out for a little while. I went out. I don't even really remember where, who's, where I went or whatever, but I do remember going outside, walking around, buying drugs, I had money, and used, and just used. Even after people have been drug free for not just days or weeks, but months or years, the tendency to relapse is very strong. So 
it is the way to understand what addictions are. The tendency to relapse is part of the disorder. It's not a failure of treatment. It's part of the disorder. I've always lost a battle, and that's how I feel. I've lost the battle again, and I'm using again. And you know, I sit in, and when I'm actually using after a battle like that, I feel so bad because I couldn't win or I didn't win. Very, very. I'm You've had a wild, yeah, a roller months here. coaster ride. Right now, I'm on a period where, like, I just can't seem to get what I want. I know yeah, what I want. Yeah, yeah. I definitely know what I want, and that's clean and sober. That's the end. So that's you, the end result. So, so you want to get know. to a good spot. It's so important to do exactly what you're doing, which is to say, if I had 11 months good functioning, clean time before, yes. I can do that again. And in fact, all the data say that the more times you keep trying, you increase your likelihood of that success being more sustained. And that's really, really important. Patients say, why can't I just stop? I've lost so much. I've paid such a high price. Parents say, why can't they just stop? They've completely wrecked their lives, our lives too. Why can't they just stop? And what we're beginning to understand now at the level of the brain is that there are a lot of cards that are stacked in the wrong direction here. I'm so strong-willed in such other things that people people could actually, there's people that would say to you, yeah, he's strong-willed in this way, so in that way, and all this. So why can't he be strong-willed so Exactly. So it's very important right, for people to try to understand. It's not a matter of moral fiber or character are just wanting it enough. Okay. You've got parts of the brain here that yes. think when they see these signals for drug that that's as important as a relationship, as the best food you ever saw. It's, it's a trick that's played on the brain and in a way that tends to leave out this decision-making part of your brain. So in the brain, we have these two important systems. The GO system, the ancient GO circuit for helping us respond to natural rewards that are so important for our survival. And the STOP system, the more recent frontal lobe system that's important for helping us consider when it's important not to go, not to act on the pull of that reward. When things are working right, the go circuitry and the stop circuitry really are interconnected and, and really talking to each other to help you weigh the consequences of a decision and decide when to go or not to go. So it's not that they're separable, they're interactive, they're interlinked at all times. It's just that it's interesting with our patient situation, it is as though they have become functionally disconnected. It is as though the ghost system is sort of running off on its own, is a rogue system now, and is not interacting in a regular, seamless, integrated way with the stop system. This is the trigger, all of this around me. And you can turn around and look at all of that, and all of that's the trigger because all of this is where I'm from. And I've always used in this area. So you imagine the trigger is here. The trigger is not only up here, the trigger is when I would walk out, open my eyes and what I see. The patient sees, smells, experiences, things that remind them of their drug of abuse. And instead of being able to say, wait, wait a minute, think about what happened last week. You lost your job, you almost lost your life. Instead, the stop system doesn't seem to get into the picture at all. It's all about go. One of the exciting things about now, in terms of our understanding addiction, is that for the first time in all of human history, we can peek inside the brain and see what may be broken. And if we can see what's broken, we have an idea about how to go about fixing it. We wanted to understand how little does it take to get this sensitive reward circuit activated and off to a head start. So what we've noticed in the past year is that the system can be activated when we show pictures that are as short as 33 milliseconds 
with things that are so short that they are outside awareness. So what's really difficult here for the stop system is we know that the message doesn't even have a chance to get up to the frontal lobes for them to weigh in. It's coming in under the radar before you have a chance to mount a defense. So what's so impressive to me is that this GO system is so incredibly sensitive that while many of the things we experience are multiple seconds long, they don't have to be to get it going. And for our patients, I think it will be a helpful piece of news because for them, they sometimes couldn't point to the cue or label the cue that set off this craving state. If this kind of moment arises so quickly, we need something to be in place to sort of bring things into a manageable range before the challenge of a go moment. We've begun to study a medication that would help quiet things down, that would sort of like tune down the volume on the go system. This medication called baclofen, it's familiar, it's been around a long time, but we found that it can reduce the activity in this system a little bit, bringing it sort of into a more manageable range. So what this picture shows is that in patients who are untreated, who have no medication, who see half-second cocaine cues, the brain has an intense dialogue. One way to think about this picture is that you're seeing a visual representation of let's go for it. And you can tell that it's a very intense dialogue because of these very hot spots. On the other hand, when we look at patients who are treated for seven days with baclofen, what you can see is that now this intense conversation has been reduced to a whisper. It's not that the brain is dead, there's activity, but instead of go, 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 it's, I don't know, it doesn't seem like it's worth going. And so the hope is that you would have a chance for the frontal lobe to do its thing, to be able to weigh in and have a chance to put into place good decision making. I do not want to live my life uh, under grips of my addiction. I, I, I will be an addict probably, I will be an addict all my life, but I want to not be an addict using. So the hope of the future is medications and behavioral treatments that can combine to literally reset the brain. All of the drugs, whether it's heroin, alcohol, cigarettes, marijuana, all of them activate the dopamine pathway. All of them. Dopamine is the neurotransmitter that's released with pleasurable events. And it is basically the neurotransmitter system that's, that defines the pleasure pathways in the brain. The drugs of abuse are five times at least more uh, reinforcing and compelling as, as the things that our brain reward system evolved in the first place to be rewarded by, like food or sex or whatever. And Drugs are so much more rewarding to our brains than that. We will do anything. They commandeer our brain reward system and drive our behavior. And that takes powerful treatments to thwart those drives. Hello, I'm, I'm uh, Dr. Nora Volkov. And I want to ask you some questions. If at any point you feel uncomfortable, just let me know. Now, um, you, you are how old? 43. So you've been taking methamphetamine for 10 years? Yeah, more or more. Yeah, about so, so how did it start there? Um, well, I was doing a lot of coke, mm -hmm. and the meth got me off the coke, for one thing. And meth gave them the same kind of buzz, but it would last longer and would cost less. How did it affect your life, methamphetamine? When, when you're not on it, you just feel so unnormal and you kind of really like to get some just to get back to a normal feeling. Place your hand in that yeah. box. That's going to get a little warm. We're going to let you rest for about 10, 15 minutes to get warm. 
Do you feel comfortable? Sure. With imaging techniques now, we can directly take pictures of the working human brain. So we can compare the brains of people that are addicted to drugs with that of people that are not addicted to drugs under very different conditions. For example, we can stress the dopamine system, which is the system that is activated by drugs. 20 seconds. So what we want to do now in this study is to see in people that are addicted to methamphetamine how the dopamine cells are functioning. Five, four, so we're measuring two, the magnitude of that surge, which is an indication of really once you stress the dopamine cells, how do they respond? It's equivalent to when, for example, they send you to a cardiologist and they put you on a treadmill. So they, they stress your, your heart to see how it responds. Okay, so we have the, the results. This, this is your image, and what we've shown is an image of a person of um, just also a, a man, man of the same age and that's not taking any drugs. Let's look at the normal brain and you see them. The areas in red show very, very high concentrations. This is one of the, the uh, cells in the brain that's most sensitive to the damaging effects of methamphetamine. Look at your brain and see how that red basically has disappeared. All of this part here is gone. You can clearly see there's much less activity in your brain than in the brain of this person. So one of the concerns is, of course, that as people that take methamphetamine grow older and continue to take it, are they putting themselves at risk for neurological diseases? That won't go away. That won't go away and that will create symptoms. So. I mean, when we were speaking, and I'm being candid with you because there's po no point of not being it. If you continue to take methamphetamine, this will not recover. I mean, it's bottom line. The other thing that concerned me too is um, this thing, and it's actually, this is your brain MRI. This brain looks like the brain of a much older person. It looks like the brain of a 60-year-old. He clearly stated to us that he himself is not convinced that he wants to get detoxify. And that's exactly not uncommon, this ambivalence of the person that's addicted, because in a one, it's like they are in love with the drug in a way, but at the same time, there is this hatred because they actually, this loss of control. But there is an, uh, clearly an ambivalence, and he expressed it. Do you feel concerned about the image of your brain? Not really. Uh, again, I, I, I don't think, uh, I don't know if they can really, really tell whether they're fudging the picture. I don't know. It is actually incredibly telling, the notion of self-deception. To what extent you can self-deceive yourself to say this drug has not done anything wrong for me. But I want to impress upon you the importance of really trying to stay clean. Because you can do a lot of recovery. Our brain has a tremendous capacity for recovery. Exactly. So hopefully if I stop using it in a year or two, it might, the red might come back. So. Yeah, we've seen it in the past, but you have to stay clean, and it's not staying clean for three months, no, over a year, so it does require that. Okay. Denial is clearly a core feature of this disorder, and that, particularly in the early stages of the illness, People just refuse to face up to the fact that their use of drugs is impacting their life in important and substantial ways. You know, if you have a disease, why not deny that you have it? We do it all of the time. So denial is not sort of unique to this disease. And uh, part of the disease itself, of course, is to deny that you have it. It really is the job of the treatment professional to take that person with all of their ambivalence about being in treatment. They don't really want to be there. They're in half in denial about it and help them see both what damage addiction has done in their lives and how much better their life can be if they get clean. Recent research has made a great deal of progress in understanding what's going on in the brain with addiction. And using brain imaging, we can actually see what's happening in the brain. We can see which parts of the brain are, are activated. And this has helped us to develop new medications for nicotine, alcohol, cocaine, methamphetamine. But with opiates, such as heroin, the real breakthrough began in the 1960s with the use of methadone. For the first time, it was found that a medication could reduce craving 
and block uh, the use of heroin, or at least the pleasure from that, and enable people to lead normal lives. They could be on methadone and function in school or in a profession or driving a car and, and do perfectly well. Then more recently, buprenorphine has come along, and buprenorphine itself is a very safe drug. It's almost impossible to overdose on it because it only partially activates the opiate receptors. And if someone takes an opiate while they're on buprenorphine, it's going to be relatively uh, blocked because of the strong affinity that uh, buprenorphine has for, for these receptors. And it's so safe that it, a doctor can give a prescription for buprenorphine for as much as a month's supply, and the patient can have their addiction treated, have their craving reduced or eliminated, and still lead a relatively normal life. Especially opiates because they are, even though they are downers, what it does me of depression pretty much is when you don't take them the right way. Like they make you feel very comfortable and relaxed and like especially with anxiety, a lot of people do them. And you're pretty much very relaxed and like chatty and you feel good for like five or six hours and then when you come off them you feel like crap. So. <laughs> Oh, well, she always takes in the animals that are hurt or somewhat brain damaged. We had the last one we had was had had, <clears throat> had seizures and that kind of stuff. Died. Yeah, had died. How do you feel, girl? I was like, I could barely sleep all night. I'm like, I couldn't get out of bed this morning, barely. I was like, oh god. <laughs> okay, well, we better get cracking. Yep. I feel really crappy. I hope it works as good as everybody says it does. So I don't have to worry about feeling like this anymore. What have you been using for drugs? I started smoking pot and doing Vicodin and drinking. And then I got introduced to acid and ecstasy. Um, Vicodin, Percocet. You started right out on those drugs. Yeah. I mean, when you first started using Yep. Is this the first treatment program you've been in? Yep. It's hard for me to get up in the morning and come though because I work so late. And but I, I'm trying my hardest to get up and be here by 9:30 or 9 o'clock or or at least by 10:30 and, and at least make one group or come for the afternoon groups or whatever I can. You know. Every person who's born in the world has a molecule in their brain that's exactly the same as morphine. First thing it does for you is it helps lift your mood so that you feel better. Second thing that it does for you is that it helps you feel motivated. It stimulates the parts of your brain that help you want to get up, go do your job, take care of your kids, work on your car, mow your lawn, all that kind of stuff. What happens when you use opiates, large amounts of opiates in particular, that you introduce from the outside is they go to these same receptor sites in your brain that this natural opiate goes to, right? And it stimulates them. Only the difference is that typically whatever drug you're using is way more potent than anything that your brain's producing. Oxycontin, morphine, heroin, dilaudid, those drugs are way more stimulating to those parts of your brain. And what happens is you go through the gross withdrawal, right, the jonesing that everybody talks about. But then what happens after that is a long period of time that we call post-acute withdrawal syndrome. That's just a fancy word for feeling like shit for days, weeks, months, years on end. And that's why 90% of the people who don't use replacement therapy relapse, because they can't stand how they feel over the long period of time. Seems like the world comes down on you. Some people say it, they taste like an orange peel, okay? Usually takes about five minutes. Suboxone, which is the brand yeah. name of the buprenorphine, that's, that Suboxone, is a very effective drug with the right kind of a patient. If you have somebody who has typically somewhat of a lower addiction profile, meaning that has not been using for as long, or maybe not been using intravenously, then Suboxone is a medication that 
is effective very quickly. Typically what you see happen with patients who take it is that they will start reporting feeling better that day, the day they initiate. Another friend of mine is also on Suboxone and he said it helps him. You know, he hasn't done a thing in years. I've been trying to get off um, opiates for over four years and I, I've been trying to do it by myself. And I realized that after two or three years of trying to do it by myself that I need help and that I can't do it by myself. So Justin has a fairly long history of using. We're not positive that this drug is going to be able to manage his addiction well enough and he may have to look at doing methadone. Yeah. Amanda's probably got a, a lesser using time, right? less time using. Yes. So it's more likely, or it's it, it, she may actually respond to Suboxone very well and Justin wouldn't. In mm -hmm. that case, he'd be a methadone candidate. Amanda would stay on Suboxone. Suboxone actually is really good. You get all your energy back. Well, I've been out for like three weeks. Mm -hmm. I think it's a wonder drug. I don't have no cravings. Uh, I, don't, I don't even crave drinking anymore, really. Nothing. I still have a couple of those. But I mean, I haven't used any drugs since I started it. Mm -hmm. Nothing first day, does, so it's really good. First day you took it, did you feel fine or did you still get withdrawals? It was alright. I was just like... Were you sore breathe. still? No. It's it doesn't take sore. aches away. No, it's not like methadone. It has like no narcotic really. You know, these people are ashamed to some degree of the things that they've had to do in order to maintain the lifestyle that they have. The people are... Everyone's mad at them, right? The whole world basically says you're a loser. And you have to have a tolerance for misbehavior, what many people perceive as misbehavior, but really are symptoms of a disorder that people have, and not eliminate people from treatment for exhibiting the symptoms of the disorder that they have. I mean, if you were treating somebody who was depressed, and they came in and said, gee, I'm having a terrible day and I feel like killing myself, you wouldn't kick them out of your treatment program because they weren't getting undepressed. But when somebody comes in with an addiction and they say, I relapsed last night and I used cocaine, very often the reaction is to say, go home. And, don't, and come back, when, come you're back when you're ready. It's an epidemic. It is so concerning, and you don't. People aren't talking about it. You know, Maine is the number one state in the nation for treatment admissions right now for opioid addiction. We are the most opioid addicted state in the country. Our rate is growing faster than anybody else in, in America. My personality and my state of mind six months ago was totally different than my state of mind right now. Like the way I think, the way I talk, the way I do everything basically changed totally when I stopped doing opiates or when I got on the spots, and, which is what I was looking for. It's is exactly what I was looking for. Just taking my life and totally turning it upside down and, and going the other way with it. So, have you have you thought about the f the future for you with Suboxone? I mean, do you, are you, is this something that you're going to continue to do over a long period of time? Do you think? I feel like it's helped a lot already. Like, I don't think that I'll have to be on it nearly as long as Justin will have to be on it. Like, I feel that I could be off in like a year. Now that I'm on Suboxone and I'm having trouble getting the insurance to be able to get it myself, I'm actually thinking about the possibility of switching to methadone because it's cheaper and I can get it for, as long as I can get it for the rest of my life free basically from Acadia. But since I'm on Suboxone, it's gonna cost me close to $150 a week without, without insurance just, just to get my medication. This is the hardest problem our patients have is affording the medication by far, hardest problem. Especially the Suboxone. Suboxone is very expensive. Mm -hmm. It's very expensive.